Hey folks, welcome to Unit 2. This is the unit on forces and translational dynamics. Um, in this first part of the unit, you'll be learning about things like mass, how to define a system, center of mass, and all the types of forces. You'll go through Newton's laws, uh, and then you'll go through um, how to use Newton's second law and how to analyze things that are moving in a circular path. So this first video is about mass, systems, and center of mass, and let's get right to it. Uh, so, we're just going to define a variable now. Mass is something that is definitely familiar to you from chemistry, but it's our first time talking about it in physics. Mass, lowercase m is the variable, is just the quantity of matter. So, any object is made of protons, neutrons, and electrons, and mass is just this very simple way of reporting the total mass of all of that stuff, the total amount of those things that contribute to the mass. Uh, mass is a scalar. There's no direction associated with mass, it's just a number from zero to as high as you can go. And then the unit for mass is the kilogram. Um, in chemistry, you would have used centimeters to measure length if you did, uh, and you would have used uh, grams to measure mass. And in physics, things are, in general, larger, and so we just use larger units. We use meters for length and kilograms for mass. Next up is system. Uh, system is defined as the collection of objects being studied. Um, and so that's like a very vague, sorry, we're going to just run record. That's a very vague definition on purpose. Um, when you do a physics problem, when you analyze a lab, when you talk to your lab partner or friend about things in physics, uh, you need to define the system. In other words, you need to identify the objects that you are going to analyze. Um, and based on the system that you choose, the physics works out a little differently. Now, it has to be consistent throughout the universe, but uh, it can play out differently. So I'm going to give one example of systems, and that's going to be bumper cars. So maybe you went to Canopy this summer, and uh, you like rode on the bumper cars, and here's a really simple picture of the bumper cars. There's one, and there's two. And so those bumper cars are like headed toward one another to collide, um, and so you're going to decide on the system. Now, for any set of two objects, there are three systems possible. So you could analyze only bumper car one. Um, so the systems that we have are just bumper car one. And everything that you do, the mass of the system is just the mass of bumper car one. Uh, any forces that are pushing or pulling on the system are all the forces that are only acting on bumper car one. Uh, and that's one system you could choose. Now, you could also just analyze bumper car two. Uh, and the same thing goes for that. The system's mass is the mass of car two. And the forces acting on the system are the forces that are pushing or pulling on car two. But what's interesting is that you can choose your system to be both of those things, system one and two, or the system is carts one and two. and now, your mass of the system is the mass of cart 1 plus the mass of cart 2. And all the forces that you are going to analyze are only the forces that come from outside the system. So when carts 1 and 2 collide, that's the two parts of your systems interacting. And that doesn't count for a force acting on the system. We say that that's internal. Um, so you do this maybe a little bit in chemistry when you talk about energy, but we're going to talk about it a lot in a bunch of units in physics. So that's just to introduce it here. Center of mass is last, um, and so this one's the most complicated because it has an equation. Uh, center of mass is defined as a point rep representing the average location for the total mass of a system. And there are a couple ways that that plays out. So uh, center of mass is abbreviated CM, 
and you would see, because we work in two dimensions here, you might see two coordinates for the center of mass, the x and the y coordinate, the horizontal coordinate and the vertical coordinate. So we're going to imagine two objects that are lying in a plane. And this line is the plane. Uh, in fact, it's going to be the x-axis. Now, object 1 has a mass of m1. Object 2 has a mass of m2. The horizontal coordinates of them are going to be x1 and x2. They lie along the x-axis, so if I know how far away this thing is from here and this thing is from there, uh, I have their coordinates. And I can calculate the coordinate for the center of mass. There's only two objects, so my equation would look like that. The first term is the mass times the location of the first mass. The second term is the mass times the location of the second mass. Now if I have like three or four masses, I just have to keep going. m times x for each object, and I add them together. The denominator is only the total mass, so m1 plus m2. And again, if I had three objects, I would continue to add more masses there. Uh, that is how you find the horizontal coordinate of the center of mass. I wouldn't need to do the vertical coordinate because these two objects lie along the x-axis. They are not oriented in a way where I need two dimensions. We'll talk about that a little bit later. The way that this equation plays out and the way that center of mass works in reality is that the center of mass is always closer to the heavier part of the system. And so the symbol for center of mass is a circle with alternating colored in and empty wedges. Um, sometimes it's oriented like this, sometimes it's oriented so that one of the lines is horizontal, it doesn't really matter. But this is the center of mass. So because m2 is bigger, we're going to infer that it has more mass. And so this term, m2, x2, is larger um, than the m1, x1, and so it essentially pulls the mass closer to that one. Uh, so for systems of particles, which is this, objects that are not connected to one another, um, that are not part of the same object, we would use this equation. Before I go to the next video, um, I just have a couple examples of this and the other way to analyze this. So I have like a plastic street hockey puck here and this puck is perfectly symmetrical and it is a single object, but it is a fully three-dimensional object. It takes up a lot of space. It's more than just one atom. So I can use symmetry to my advantage. Because it's symmetrical in all directions, I can be confident that the center of mass is right in the middle of the puck. So I do want to write a little note for you. Um, you can also use symmetry to find the center of mass. You can't do it all the time, but you can do it some of the time. Um, another example of that would be this roll of tape. So this roll of tape has the same shape as the puck, um, except it's open in the middle. Now all of the mass is distributed pretty much equally around the outside, and so you can use symmetry and you can say the center of mass is also right in the middle of the tape. So center of mass doesn't have to be where there is stuff, it can be in this empty space between. Uh, the last example is this nifty little uh, eagle here that is balancing on my fingertip. And so if I put this under the, um, under the camera, you can see the symmetry for one dimension, but also not for the other dimension. Okay, so this eagle is symmetrical uh, from left to right, right. If I drew a line here, the eagle looks exactly the same on the left as it does on the right. And so I can be confident that the center of mass lies along this line. However, there's no symmetry this way. If I drew a line along this axis of the eagle, there's nowhere I can put this where the eagle looks the same above and below that. So symmetry can only get you so far with the eagle. Uh, we would need a more complex analysis to figure out that the eagle could balance on my finger if I put the beak on my finger. Uh, and so that's the end of this video. In the next video, we'll tackle some examples together.